associated with Darwin, obviously, Charles Darwin, um, evolutionary theory was given a huge um, impetus by his research in the 19th century. And he was himself a kind of humanist. He didn't really believe in any religion, although he was brought up in the Christian Unitarian tradition, which is uh, number 136. His father was a medical doctor in Shrewsbury, where I used to live near there. And um, they're very, they have a Darwin festival every year, which I took part in. And his father, Richard Darwin, I believe it was, or Robert, was a medical doctor who who took old Charles as a boy to the Unification, sorry, not Unification, the Unitarian Church, and insisted, you know, that he learn a bit. But he was always grumbling and didn't really like it. Yeah, number 47, Unitarian Universalism, um, which is basically, it, it, it's the branch of Christianity that doesn't, it doesn't think the Trinity should be regarded as an absolute truth. It, it's it's an it's a useful way of talking about God, but it's not absolutely true. You know, it's a picture language, as Hegel would say, mm. um, which works for some people, doesn't work for others. The real reality of God, I mean, the absolute reality of God is like we don't really know. Let's be honest, because you'd have to master all 168 boxes, and that's just on this planet. I mean, like, you know, you'd have to master all, all the other religions in trillions of galaxies to really know what God is. Or you get access to someone that's got a sort of map like this. Um, so anyway, Darwin felt that as a boy, um, he rejected the religious teachings. He went to Cambridge University and he was drawn to science, um, which disappointed his parents who wanted him to either be a lawyer or a priest, a, a clergyman. But like most children do the opposite of what parents want. So he became um, a scientist. And he got this voyage on a ship, the Beagle, which took him around the world. And he was one of those irritating young boys that gather everything, specimens. They bring in snails to the house. They bring in types of seaweed or whatever. And he came back with a huge collection of stuff, like eggs, plants, and types of animals that he found. And he worked out as he was going around that there are different, like every species has variations in them. Like we humans have variations. We're one species, mankind, but we have different types, right? Um, and, and so the same with dogs. Think about dogs. There's, I don't know, hundreds of different species. There's like fierce pit bull terriers, and then there's like little kind of French dogs that women go around Paris with on a string and they're just like make a little yapping noise you know and so why why does life have all these variations that was the question Darwin wanted to know and before him the traditional answer was well God created it like that you know if you asked a monk in a monastery down here in Beitet a thousand years ago why why are there different kinds of birds well God created it like that. Don't ask naughty questions. Just read the Bible. Because it says in the beginning, in the first few chapters, God creates the earth and then the animals and then mankind. Like, that whole thing takes seven days. Right? Now that's the official version. The Kabbalah, by the way, explains that the seven days are not days in the sense that, you know, like a day. That's pretty quick. It's seven phases of evolution. So the Kabbalah, actually, the secret teachings, which Darwin knew nothing about, he'd never studied, actually is much wiser than he realised. He threw out the Bible, he said, this is ridiculous. But he'd never studied the secret teachings, which do talk about um, uh, phases of, of creation. Right. Um, <clears throat> we'll come back to that when we look at Egypt. So... Darwin was determined to explain the species variations through a purely mechanistic um, uh, way of explaining. And he hit on this idea of the, um, the theory of natural selection. So, you know, dogs flourish. I mean, because humans quite like them and they're pets and, and people share puppies and all that. But if a dog evolved that had three heads and was always biting off babies' fingers... I mean, God forbid, right? That dog would die out pretty soon because no, no pet owners would want it. 
maybe a few really crazy people would, would cultivate that horrible dog. But on the whole, dogs have survived because they're quite helpful and kind and look after your stuff and they guard your house. And so there's this symbiotic relationship of, of, of mutual um, interest between the dog and the human, which goes back to about 20,000 years ago. Our ancestors first started cultivating dogs. Same with cats. Um, and, and the variant of species comes about, said Darwin, because... Species that evolve features that, that don't work tend to die out. And it leaves the ones that, that do work in, in the dominant position. That's the theory of natural selection. Um, now, Darwin at the time didn't understand about... He, he kind of, they talked about genes because he knew about the work of Mendel, Gregor Mendel, who was a Christian monk in Austria, who'd, who'd been growing flowers... And he'd been studying how the characteristic of, like, one sweet pea, pink sweet pea, was handed down to the next generation. And he did some really important scientific experiments about how plants um, pass down their characteristics. And he worked out, you know, we know how plants do it. They have, like, sexual parts, the petals, the stamen, the pistula, and all that stuff. They, they pass, we now know it's a genetic code that's being handed down. Darwin didn't know about the genetic code, but we do now. And so Darwinian evolutionary theory says that life evolves through this genetic code, transmitting its, its coding down to the next generation. So I've inherited half my mother's genetic code and half my father's, exactly. And in turn, I've given that to my three daughters. Um, I think... They're, you know, they're good genes, I hope. I mean, my parents are amazing. I love them, you know. That's why I've survived, you know. If I, if I was a horrible person, they sort of chopped off babies' heads, I'd, I'd be, uh, I wouldn't be around, you know. Um, anyway, that's the theory. Um, there was another chap who I prefer to Darwin called um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who lived at the same time as Darwin, um, and who also came up with the idea of Evolution through natural selection. He was he was nearly dying in Malaysia. He was also one of these collector types. He he'd been around to Latin America and now Malaysia, and he'd gathered all these plants and animals and stuff. And he had exactly the same idea. Almost the same time. It's really weird. Um, he was in a, a dream, um, taking medicine for his like he was nearly dying. I think he had malaria or something. And he suddenly saw natural selection as the answer. And he wrote to Darwin and said, guess what, I've had this amazing idea. Natural selection, that's how evolution works. Like the penny drop. And Charles Darwin was sort of slightly annoyed because he had the same idea. And he'd written it down in a manuscript he'd never published. And he had an ethical dilemma. Like, this other guy's got the same... It's as if someone in Borneo thought of the periodic table of the world's philosophy and religions and writes to me, just as I'm about to publish it, and says, guess what? I've, you know, created a table. In fact, nobody has. Um, but Darwin was... Anyway, they worked out a solution, which was they both presented a paper to the Linnaean Society in London, which is the society of uh, people that study evolution of plants and animals and everything. And they, they co-authored, um, well, they presented their two separate papers at the same meeting, which is a nice gentleman's way of dealing with it. Um, but it's become called Darwin evolutionary theory because he was more middle class, had better connections, a richer family, and, um, you know, had all the right connections. Wallace was more of a maverick um, and from a less, less wealthy background. So we don't talk about Wallace's theory of evolution. Also... Wallace didn't think it explained everything. He said natural selection can explain the physicality of the species, but it doesn't explain their mental abilities. And he thought there was something else which I call supernatural selection. He thought there must be... He got very interested in the study of spiritualism, and he was studying mediums and seances scientifically, and he, he saw evidence that proved to him the survival of the soul after death. 
And therefore, he said, well, how do you explain that, Darwin? You know, like there's got to be something else, another level of explanation to do with evolution, which, which Darwin didn't even say was a, a thing. He, he couldn't think it. And in fact, there's a classic thing, and I gave a lecture about this, because I, I set up the Alfred Russell Wallace Memorial Lecture to honour this guy, because I think he's been neglected by science. Um, and Wallace persuaded Darwin to come to a, a medium seance in London, in Harley Street. He said, Charles, you know, just suspend judgment. Let's go. See what happens, you know. If you get your great-great-grandfather's spirit coming through and he says stuff that you didn't know anyone knew, you'll just have to accept it, you know, because the medium doesn't know that. And that had happened to Wallace, so he wanted to persuade Charles to come to the medium. And Charles said, OK, OK. And he went to the sales. It was specially arranged. And it started. But just before it started, Darwin suddenly felt ill. He, he had to go and lie down upstairs because he, he had a bad health problem. He was always getting ill, having headaches, stomach aches. You know, he was, he, whatever the cause, nobody ever knew what was the matter with it. But he just got ill at that moment when the medium was starting. And he went upstairs to lie down. And then the session started and the table started rocking. The table lifted up in the air, no one touching it. Then the chairs joined the table up there. And like everyone saw this, they, they were doctors, scientists, including Wallace, watching this incredible phenomena. This is called physical mediumship, when mediums can do this kind of stuff. And they explain it because spirits are doing it, you know. Um, and incredible displays happened, right? And in the end, the whole, all the furniture was piled up in one corner of the room, right? And they were all sitting there. What happened? An hour and a half later, two hours later, Darwin came down and said, did I miss anything? <laughs> Yawning, did I miss anything? You know, and they just looked at him and laughed. Yeah, he missed everything. <laughs> and that was the closest he ever got to like seeing this stuff that he just, he, he was like um, Nelson, he put a blind eye to the telescope. And that's why I'm part of what's called the Galileo Commission. We're trying to say, look at the evidence for this stuff. You, you know, let's come up with a theory that properly explains it. Because there is, there does seem to be something that survives after death. Um, there was a Frenchman called Alan Kardec who founded the spiritualist movement in France. He was a scientist, an empiricist, a mathematician. He'd, he'd studied under great teachers. But he saw the evidence and it persuaded him. And he was persecuted by the church. They banned his books. But... He, he said, no, you know, the facts are the facts. And there's a new Netflix movie about Alan Kardec, which is really worth watching. Um, so anyway, that's evolutionism, which, as I say, it has different textures. and But the theory of natural selection is the core. And the Darwinians are still saying they can explain everything. They don't need anything spiritual. Well, to me, they're like, they're like Darwin going up and having a nap. They're not looking at the evidence. And they refuse to look at the evidence. Um, I have a book, up, uh, sorry, a movie uh, called Expelled upstairs on DVD, which is about how neo-Darwinians have like dominated um, scientific departments and publications and journals in the Anglo-Saxon world in America and, and Britain. If you, um, you know, unless you adhere to the Darwinian worldview, you don't get published and you don't get a professorship. Is, is the claim of this film expelled. And if it comes out that you're thinking, mm, maybe there's something spiritual in, behind it, you get, you get expelled. And the film interviews people that this has happened to. And it's a bit scary, actually, in my opinion. Um, so that's that, um, <clears throat> evolutionism. But there are people fighting back. There are people like the Galileo Commission saying, no, we are actually the real scientists here. We're following Wallace. We're looking at the real evidence. You know, and they, there are some great people at Oxford University and stuff, philosophers, who are saying this, um, um, you know, and some of them are my friends. Okay, now what's this got to do with Egypt? That's the question. Brilliant. Let's go and look at number four then. Ancient Egyptian religion 
which has come down to us partly known as the Hermetic tradition. Um, it was a Frenchman, Champollion, who translated the hieroglyphs into modern language so we can read Egyptian inscriptions. Before that, we couldn't read them. We'd lost the key. And it was in France that Egyptology became a big thing. The Egyptologists went to Egypt, like, copied down all the inscriptions, and then translated them, and brought some of the mummies and things back to the Louvre. You know, it's a great centre for e Egyptian studies here in France, <coughs> and I'm proud to be living here. They discovered that it's an incredibly sophisticated, rich civilization, religiously and intellectually and philosophically. These Egyptians invented geometry, advanced mathematics, they were great at medicine, they had sophisticated medical ways of treating people who were ill. Um, they, um, I mean, they invented things like, you know, um, lipstick for women and, and eyeshadow and all the, all, the, all the kind of makeup that girls do when they go out to a party. It was Egyptians who invented that. And they got the formula for it. They, they made it, you know, so that... Because if you look at the paintings of the ancient Egyptians, men and women, they're, they're all very beautiful, aesthetically. Um, they loved art, dance, music. Egyptian music was very sophisticated. Um, and they loved life. They were a life-loving um, people, right? Um, they were really good at agriculture. They, they could grow enough in the Nile Valley to feed a lot of people and keep an advanced civilization going for 4,000 years, you know. Um, and <clears throat> when the Greeks discovered Egypt, they got really excited. And to be a philosopher in Greece, you had to go and spend time in Egypt, because that was like, that was the Mecca. That was the California of the day. So um, Democritus, who founded the atomic theory, great scientist, he went to Egypt. And he's famous because it's said that he was also interested in alchemy. Because the Egyptians liked matter. They studied matter, but they wanted to see the spirit in the matter, which is why they, they created alchemy, which is a word for Egypt. It's an Arabic word, al-chem. Chem is Egyptian for black. And in Egypt, black is a sacred color. The pupil at the center of the eye is black. And that is the soul. That's the window on the soul. It's black because it receives the light. So being black in Egypt is a really great thing. These were, these were often Negro, black Egyptians. And that to them is a holy colour. The earth is black. It gives us fertility. And so the black arts actually means that. The arts from Egypt. The black land. The fertile land. Um, and it was the greatest civilization Africa has ever produced, you know. Um, and it influenced a lot of the tribes elsewhere in Africa. I've just written a paper about African culture and what it can do for the world now. And, and I write about Egypt a lot. Um, they had a sort of theory of evolution in Egypt, but it was a more spiritual evolution theory, um, like Wallace. <clears throat> and so... In the Hermetic writings, which is what we've got philosophically, um, it talks about how God creates the universe. There's a text called the Kore Cosmo, which is Isis, the goddess of the universe, talking to her son Horus about how creation comes into being. And God creates, I mean, actually it's a council of gods. The Egyptians believe there's a council of gods, like a kind of democratic assembly in heaven each god has a hand in creation and that's that's why the bible says that elohim create this world moses spent time studying in egypt and you can find lots of egyptian thinking in moses and in the kabbalah it's you know hugely influenced um and that's why i've said and discovered in my research that it's almost certain that Jesus, when he was a young man, spent time studying in Egypt, because that was where everyone went, if you were precocious and intelligent and want to be an intellectual. And um, Philo, the great rabbi of the day, was teaching in Egypt. Alexandria had the biggest library in the world, with scrolls, like everything, you know. Of course you'd want to go there. 
And that's where they translated the Bible into Greek, 300 years before Jesus even came into the scene. And most of the Jewish intellectuals in Alexandria spoke both Hebrew and Greek, as I'm sure did Jesus. And his father took the family to Egypt to escape um, Herod's crazy trying to kill them all thing. So there's a, there's a strong hermetic tradition in Christianity as well. Also, it's there in Islam, because, um, again, Islam, the Quran, believes that God creates the universe, but there's an evolution of spiritual, ethical stuff going on alongside the physical. It's not just the physical evolution. There's a divine consciousness or mind, which they call Allah, which watches over the universe and tries to make it come out right. And God sends divine prophets like Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, to try and get humanity tuned. It's like my piano was out of tune. I had to get a tuner in. So and every now and then God sends a piano tuner to mankind to tune us back into harmony. That's what the Egyptians believed. And it's what Muhammad believed and Jesus. What I've discovered in my commentary on the Quran is that Muhammad believed he was descended from an Egyptian princess called Hagar who married Abraham. Well, she was his concubine, but it was like a marriage, right? <clears throat> and I think it's true. I think Hagar is the source of a lot of the African-Egyptian wisdom in Islam. And I've discovered that the Muslims know this and are proud of it. They call themselves descendants of Hagar. And, and there's Muslim scholars now saying, we're going to reclaim our Egyptian roots, you know. And monotheism was an Egyptian realisation that... Behind all the netters, the individual gods, there's a divine unity at work. Just like to do mathematics, you need the number one. It's the source of all the other numbers. Every number is, a, is if you think of oneness and then you cut it and divide it, you get all the other numbers. But you have to have the one to start the ball rolling. And that was the Egyptian insight. There's got to be a one god from which all the other gods come. Now that's what I call esoteric monotheism, and the Egyptians are masters of this. In the Hermetic writings, if you've not read them, it explains all this. And, um, yeah, so, um, deep stuff, really. Read the Corey Cosmo. I've recorded it. It's on my Green University website, and it's the most important of all the Hermetic scriptures. Um, and it raises the interesting question of how souls get into bodies, and why did God create, you know, um, and put souls into these bodies? And, you know, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Listen to my writing about it. Um, okay, I'll stop there because I could go on and on, but let's do another one. <laughs> it's, it's a great question, though. Um, and also, I'll just say one last thing. When I studied in London for 10 years, and I taught at the university and all that, I often used to go and read in the British Museum Library, where Karl Marx studied. And Karl Marx dedicated his book, Das Kapital, to Darwin. Marx believed, he was trying to explain society and social conflict and, you know, how we can achieve happiness on Earth. He wanted to be scientific like Darwin. So he dedicated the book to Darwin. And when you go into the British Museum Library, where I went I studied for years... I didn't mean Marx, he was dead long before I got there, but, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. You have to go up, you walk through these corridors, which are full of ancient Egyptian mummies. And the British Museum has a huge collection of Egyptology. And, um, um, you know, it, it's, it's a great centre for Egyptological studies. And I just, I always smile when I think Marx had to walk through the same corridors. Um... And he, he knew about that stuff too, a, a little bit, about because um, uh, it, the Egyptian hermetic wisdom is also the root of Freemasonry. And as I explained in my esoteric study of Marxism, there's a Freemasonic side to Marx's work that nobody talks about. You know, Lenin, Stalin, they didn't understand a single thing about all what I'm talking about. The French Marxists kind of do a bit. Um, but it's, it's, you know... Um, and Napoleon, just to say, 
was the guy that wanted to go to Egypt to discover all these mysteries because he was a Freemason. People don't even know Napoleon was inspired by Freemasonry to, to go to Egypt. And, and it's a shame, history. Instead of fighting it, the British should have sent a team of Savills as well. Britain and France should have, like, worked on this together. Instead, they had wars and, you know, Waterloo. And, um, and we're still, we still got that problem. I mean, I would like to live in a world where Russian intellectuals, Ukrainian intellectuals, French, British, we all find these mysteries out together in peace instead of bombing each other, you know. Um, so I'll ask, I'll leave this topic with a, another question. Is there a force that's against evolution? Is there an anti-evolution force that wants to destroy mankind or see us all die or, you know, have a nuclear world blowing up? You know, is there a Lucifer at work on the planet that's trying to destroy evolution? Um, the Egyptians have a theory about that, how, how, how creation has gone slightly wrong. Um, and it's, it's in the Cori Cosmo. Um, and its story is quite interesting. It says that um, after, after God creates the earth and, and bodies, um, everything, animals, yeah, it's all beautiful. But there are these really arrogant spirit beings, like semi-angels, almost gods, that want to sort of be better than they are. And they try and take over heaven, says the Egyptian myth in Cori Cosmo. And, and God gets really annoyed. And so as a punishment, he creates human beings and puts the souls of these naughty angels into human beings. That's what we all are. We're like, we were gods that rebelled, tried to be better than we were. And so God, for a laugh, said, OK, you can go and have a human life now. And that's, that's sort of the Egyptian take on how evil gets into the world. And it's a version of the, the fall of Lucifer story, which in, is in the Bible um, and in the Gnostic teachings, you know. So, um, so, so maybe that's the anti-evolution force. I'm just, I'm just thinking aloud here. I'm speculating as a philosopher. Um, but these are questions that are not very few people, you know, are asking. And I'd love to know the answers. And um, okay, well, we'll leave it there and um, come back to that another time. Yeah. Okay, now, do you have another couple you want to look at? So... I have to find the box again. Mm. Uh, I don't think I have challenged you yet with Zoroastria. Okay. Listen. Yeah, yeah. Primal, Central, Asian, Turkey, Mongolian. <laughs> okay. Uh, what number is that one? It's 35. Right, 35 is Primal, Central, Asian, yeah. That's 122 a is Zoroastrian. Oh, okay, that's fun. Mm. Right. Um, okay, let's do the um, Zoroastrian first. 122, that's the sort of uh, purple colour. Um, Zoroaster was a prophet from um, actually Afghanistan, from a city called Bulk in, in Afghanistan. It's thought. There's a lot of discussion, you know. I mean, we haven't found his grave. There's no absolute proof. But scholars who've researched his scriptures, called the Gathas, which are the hymns that he, he gave, or poems, they've analysed the dialect they're written in, which is a, it's a very old form of Indo-European, like Sanskrit. Um, and the words are similar to Sanskrit. And so they know roughly the date. It's about 1700 BC, which is almost the same time as Abraham, coincidentally. You know, they were alive on the planet at the same time, which is be fascinating. Zoroaster was a pagan priest in this ancient Indo-European religion, which is very similar to Druids. He worshipped fire, the magic of fire, because it's the purificatory force. And he, um, he worshipped Ahura Mazda, who is the lord of, of light and the lord of all that is good, the creator, Ahura Mazda. Um, and he said that we humans should worship 
the Lord, our Creator, with good thoughts, good words and good deeds. Um, and if we all do that, we're living righteously. And we can, when we die, we can be embraced into the heaven of Ahura Mazda, who's waiting, you know, uh, with a heavenly library, in my case. Um, he, he, he said that we're up, we've got trouble on this planet because there's also a counterforce. So he, he took this idea of, that the Egyptians had, that there is this counterforce of arrogance. And actually God has a rival or an enemy who's an enemy God, an enemy to God, who is called um, Ahriman in Zoroastrianism, which we would translate as the devil. There is this force. And ever since God created the universe and this planet, um, Ahriman has been trying to destroy it. Why? Well, you know, if you read the Zoroastrian scriptures, um, it's like an older brother that's just really horrible, you know, and bullying. And, like, why are people like that? I don't know. Um, I mean, Osiris had Set, who tried to kill him. Um, there's this sort of rivality goes on uh, between people. And Zoroaster said it's going on with, with the gods too. There's the good god that we should worship, and then there's the evil god we should shun. Every time we lie, steal, horrible, hurt somebody, violent, you know, all that stuff, we're feeding Araman. They believe, Zoroaster said, I've come as the prophet of this age, 1700 BC, but after I'm gone, you know, treasure my words, keep what I'm saying, follow the right path. And later on, he didn't specify the time, there will come a successor to me, and he will be called the Seyashant, which means saviour or redeemer. And he will complete my work, and he will finally defeat the forces of evil. I haven't been able in this life to do that completely, but the Seyashant is coming, and he will complete that mission. And then humanity will be saved from it. Because humanity doesn't deserve to be destroyed by this evil force. Okay, that religion, that's what we call Zoroastrianism, that spread from Afghanistan to Iran. And it became the religion of the Persian Empire, of, of the great king Darius and um, Xerxes and other of these great Persian kings that we know about from history. They worshipped Ahura Mazda. And we've got um, sculptures on, on engraved on walls, which they left of, you know, uh, Ahura Mazda's pictured um, as a sort of being with, with, with wings. You don't see a face. It's not like, you know, an old man with a beard. It's just an invisible spirit with wings. Um, and so we know from art, from ancient Persian art, that they worship this, this deity. Um, and it's inspired and, and it's still going. I have friends who are Zoroastrians. I've met quite a few of them. I've been to the Zoroastrian temple, both in London and in India. Um, there's only about 150,000 hardcore Zoroastrians left on the planet. Um, they're beautiful people. They, they are truth-speaking, truth reliable, kind, um, amazing people. Now, <clears throat> when... Um, bit of a twist to the story which is um, because it became an imperialist thing the Persian Empire said we're the we're the best empire in history you've all got to do what we say because we've got Ahura Mazda at our back so if you don't follow the Emperor's will you must be working with the devil and you're evil so we'll kill you that they hijacked, in the name of imperialism, what had been originally a good idea. I think Zoroaster was a good idea, interesting. But they converted it into a sort of justification for imperialism. So when the Persian army turned up on, on Greece, saying, we're going to conquer you, and you're all...